So, we'll continue with the topic today. We'll discuss about the strategies for development of new non-toxic uh, transporter modulators. So, if you are looking at the transporters, what, how, what, what are the targets? Like how you could develop modulators for transporters? There are three levels. One is the cell surface level where you look at the function of these transporters. And I just chose three, the most important that we know of uh, as of now. But this could be applicable to others if we find more. So uh, you look for high affinity inhibition of function uh, of transporters at the plasma membrane. You could also find modulators which will inter intervene in the signal transduction level so that the expression of transporters is, you know, uh, intervened. You can inhibit that or even at gene expression level by using modulators which, <coughs> excuse me, uh, act at the promoter, promoter site or transcription factors where you can prevent the induction. But most of the studies actually are, you know, more, as you will be aware, are focused more on blocking the function of the transporters at cell surface. Okay. So, these modulator, development of modulators for transporters actually began in early 1980s. And um, so, so far, we have like first generation was the Vrapmil quinidine. Then after five to seven years, early 90s, then the second generation modulators were uh, developed, which is cyclosporine A and the analog of cyclosporine A, valspodar. And then mid 90s to early 2000s, high affinity third generation compounds were developed like Zuscudar, Terikidar, Ilacridar. But I thought instead of giving you this historical background, which is very well covered by this review of 2012, I think you have the PDF of that. So you have the access of that. Instead of discuss, spending time on discussing that, I thought we could look at more recent. Uh, approaches and what we learned from new things. So why were these modulators not successful? Okay. So as Professor Patwadhan had told us on Monday morning about the approaches, in early 80s people really thought that you could have a magic bullet, like you just give a very high concentration of one compound and hope that it will inhibit Pig like a protein because those days people only knew about existence of pig like a protein and no other transporter. For example, the ABCG2 was discovered only in 1998, whereas MRP1 was discovered, discovered in 1992. So these were more recent than pig like a protein, which was shown to be present from 1976. Okay, so that's why. The earlier trials only concentrated on pig like a protein. Because at that time, there was unawareness about the role of other transporters with similar substrate specificity, or also even the fact that there is a polyspecificity. Lack of understanding of the role of blood brain barrier. Because we did not know about the existence of other transport, transporters, people didn't really appreciate the role of blood brain barrier. Then use of very, uh, you know, um, actually which should have been high concentrations, which led to toxic effects. And the dosages were not very well regulated. And, and when people did different uh, clinical trials, they were not communicated to each other. So, you know, we didn't know much about. And then also the selection of patient population, which was very random, not knowing different things, because of which from first generation to third generations, there is not a single uh, chemical entity uh, in, in the clinic which can reverse drug resistance. And now we know why this was a problem because you don't have a single transporter. You have multiple transporters with polyspecificity. You also know that blood brain barrier plays a very important role. Uh, there are also differences that the, you cannot use high concentrations and patient population. Okay, so actually we have been also, you know, studying in addition to mechanistic aspects of transporters, we have been studying 
uh, what are the other ways we could develop modulators. And obviously, you know, you could try to use natural product modulators like curcumin, then plumbagin is a natural analog of vitamin K3. Uh, natto extract, which is Japanese fermented soybean food, which is rich of vitamin K12 and isoflavonoids. You will see a lot of Japanese reports. Uh, every breakfast, actually this is a very uh, common breakfast uh, food in Japan, natto extract. Then steam of folin, this is from Thai folk medicine. Then Kugasin J, which is actually isolated from bitter melon uh, or karela. In addition, there are multiple uh, compounds and chemicals known from marine, spa, you know, marine sponge derived sifolins and triterpenoids, botulinumides from the marine uh, animals as well as. Then we also have small molecule. Uh, compounds like disulfiram, we talked about this about on Monday, and uh, the targeted therapeutic um, drugs which are already in the clinic, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So I don't think I need to give you the introduction for terminic or the curcumin, but basically it's a one to five percent curcuminides in the terminic powder. So it has a multiple effects of process proliferation. Uh, also has the effect on the transcription factors, a potent antioxidant, anti-inflammatory agent. Uh, and then earlier, uh, 2000 people were excited that it was also used to rescue the mutant CFTR or cystic fibrosis protein to the cell surface. But those studies were not reproducible. That was one of the fluke uh, that unfortunately didn't work out. Okay. So there are three main components in the curcumin, your curcuminoids. A major one is the curcumin one, uh, 70 to 75 percent. Curcumin two is 12 to 15 percent. Curcumin three. So what we found is, although initially you have to do the studies with isolated compounds, you could use the mixture of all three and get the same effect. So first attempt always is with the cell lines and biochemical studies, and as you can see here. This is, you know, work more than two or three years where you look at pig like a protein, MRP1, ABCG2. This curcumin actually has the stimulation of this ATPase activity. And these are just, when you look at the concentration required for stimulation, it sort of gives you the relative affinity of curcumin mixture. So it ranges from 5 nanomolar to 15, uh, 500 nanomolar to 1.5 micromolar. But the plasma concentration can be reached about 2.5 to 5 micromolar, so it, it's within that range. Then we also looked at its ability to compete for drug binding, and you can see this. And then the MTT assay to look at cell, toxic, cell toxicity, and you have the fold resistance uh, reversal. So in cell lines, these data were you know, showing that, yes, you can use the modulator. Then we used the rat brain capillaries because at least it's more uh, appropriate to look at uh, blood-brain barrier. And here the, we discussed this on Monday, how the capillaries are used. So this is with the um, body piprazosin, an increasing concentration of curcumin going from, you know, uh, 10 nanomolar to five mic uh, one micromolar. And as you can see, it inhibits, and this is the control inhibitor. Similar studies were also done with pig like a protein and it shows that it inhibits the blood brain barrier activity of PGP at blood brain barrier and MRP1. So this was, we were quite excited that we have a compound which inhibits all three major transporters. So some of the pharmacokinetic data we actually used then the ABCG2 which is the substrate or the sulfosalazine is the substrate. And you can see when you use the curcumin even at 5 micromolar, you can increase the or retain more sulfosalazine in plasma compared to without the curcumin. Again, this is showing that if you inhibit ABCG2, you can uh, increase the concentration of the, your substrate in the plasma. And then we used the nude mice xenograft model where 
these mice were you know the PGP expressing cells were actually deposited into to generate the xenograft and then 200 milligram per uh, kg curcumin was given through the gavage uh, orally and uh, as you can see you can show that uh, indeed curcumin treatment in our in the presence of doxorubicin which is the anti-cancer agent you can get the reduction in tumor size so the next actually attempt we wanted to actually do is to go over to the clinical trials unfortunately uh, none of the institutions would pick up clinical trials with curcumin because in the US, US this is curcumin is considered as a traditional medicine which is not patentable for uh, commercial use so our NCI Institute unfortunately we couldn't convince them to do the clinical trials but uh, there are some clinical trials actually ongoing so but anyway the conclusions of this study was that among curcuminoids curcumin is the one is the most effective form uh, in increasing sensitivity of cells expressing pgp abc g2 or mrp1 and the potency is g2 to abc b1 to c1 it inhibits the activity of pgp abc g2 in rat brain capillaries we also repeated for mrp1 Oral administration of curcumin enhances the plasma levels of sulfasalazine, which is the substrate for ABCG2. Similar studies have been also done for p glycoprotein. And in mouse PGP expressing tumor model treatment with curcumin enhances cytotoxic effects. So this was sort of a first study to show that yes, it's possible to do such studies. And there are quite a few clinical trials, but the major limitation is the very poor bioavailability. Okay. And the reason is the curcumin is actually when it's given, you have a gluconeogenization in intestinal cells as well as in liver rapidly, and uh, it's then degraded. But the cytochrome P453A. Um, is actually inhibited by piperin that prevents the gluconeogenization. So people then started using piperin, which is the black pepper ingredient, in combination with curcumin, so that you can inhibit the metabolism of curcumin and increase the absorption. Use the mixture of curcumin and piperin to, or you know, liposome encapsulated curcumin, and actually currently. If you go to the U.S. Uh, drug uh, stores or uh, other uh, departmental stores, you can buy curcumin as a mixture of curcumin plus piperin as dietary uh, supplement. But I don't know anybody has yet tried uh, clinical trials. So I was trying to yesterday, I mean this morning, to see whether I can get it exact information about what's the percentage ratio of curcumin and piperin. But all I can see is that like a 95% extract or in addition to like piperin 1% extract. So it's very vague. Uh, it's not easy. But in our studies, we found you need about 10 micromolar piperin. And uh, 5 micromolar curcumin is, you know, there is no toxicity. Curcumin actually, there is no toxicity even up to 50 micromolar. And uh, piperin is up to 20 micromolar. So you could... Some of the studies I found where they use the ratio is if you are giving 200 milligram curcumin, you give 10 milligram piperin. Uh, that's sort of the ratio. Uh, since it's not toxic, it's okay. But then you now you I just uh, you know you can see these kind of in, sort of warning labels are given that this in only informational purposes. Like there is no scientific basis, so people should be aware that you know. You can't just take this alone, okay? So we also looked at to see whether vitamin K3 or plumbagen uh, would be useful as modulators because plumbagen is a naturally occurring naphthoquinone present in the roots, leaves, bark, and wood of uh, julgen species, which is the walnut, Persian walnut, California walnut. Inhibits cell pro pro proliferation by initiating apoptosis. Uh, K3 is a um, structural precursor of vitamin K1 and vitamin K2 because which these are important for even the mitochondrial respiration, ox oxidative phosphorylation. Fish meals and green plant supplements uh, 
are rich sources of natural vitamin K. These are the chemical structures. Although I'm not going to show you the data, but these are the conclusions for the studies, those, those studies that plumbogen and vitamin K3 can inhibit ABCG2 mediated deflux of substrates. Uh, it also has effect on peak glycoprotein, but not, um, actually not the peak glycoprotein, but the MRP1. Uh, but this was a, a compound which specifically affected ABCG2, uh, but not PGP or MRP1, so it was not that useful. And so we discontinued these studies. Then we sort of, you know, by that time we knew there are multiple drug binding sites. And we thought, can we take a chemical approach? As we see, um, I think uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, we looked at the, this was a slide I had shown you where there are, you know, two uh, independent sites based on the X-ray structure. Uh, these are the H and R sites based on biochemical studies and then multiple sites. So what we thought is, if you take a substrate which binds to one site and then put a linker, chemical linker, and put again the same structure, like another uh, molecule of the same substrate, let's say doxorubicin. So can we make the two substrates bind to both sites and then block it? Because if simultaneously two molecules bind into two different sites, you should expect uh, inhibition of the transporter. So for that we used, there is a polyene uh, antibiotic called stipiamide. And this is the structure of the monomer. It's a very hydrophobic. And then we actually, so you can see the, you know, this is one molecule of stipamide. This is another molecule of stipamide with the linker region. Unfortunately, what we found is, although one monomer binds to the one site, when you make this kind of uh, dimer, the length of the linker region is important. The, if you make a linker region more than six, uh, you know, uh, carbon uh, 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 things, it starts folding on itself. So it doesn't remain rigid. It's very flexible. And because of which we were not able to pursue this study. But now people have started, re, you know, reinventing this for some of the um, epilepsy drugs which directly go to blood-brain barrier. So there is a group in... Uh, Purdue University, USA, and they have started using this approach. So in addition, then we also decided to use medicinal chemistry approach, okay? So we knew earlier, I showed you the data about mouse pig like a protein, which was uh, complexed with a cyclic peptide inhibitors to identify the drug binding pockets. So the basic uh, structure of that is this um, peptide mimetic of the valine amino acid. Uh, you, you might remember this. And then we decided with the help of medicinal chemist, can we modify the groups on that scaffold and see whether we can improve the efficiency. So we were able to you know, go from 1.5 micromolar to maybe one or below one. And then now we again went back to this increased the compounds to about 100 different compounds, but unfortunately that approach also has not been uh, useful, which is to make structure activity related groups. Okay? So, you have any questions up to this part? Because I'm going to switch the gears now and bring to the different Approach. So we looked at the natural product. We also looked at chemical compounds that you can use. And then in 2000, you know, the Novartis came out with a uh, imatinib drug, which specifically inhibited BCR able tyrosine kinase. And that was very effective treatment for chronic myeloid leukemia. But then last 15 to 17 years now, the, these are the targets which have been identified like EGFR receptor, uh, VGFR receptor, KIT, PDGFR, and FLT3 kinase, as well as ALK kinase. You also must have heard about the BRAF kinase, which is involved in melanoma, okay? 
But interestingly now, you, and these are the, the number of tyrosine kinase inhibitors which have been developed, which are already in the clinic. But as the pa patients are given these, now they find that most of these actually are transported by p glycoprotein and ABCG2 because of which higher concentrations need to be given and patients start developing resistance. So these number of tyrosine kinases, actually inhibitors are already in the clinic for chronic myeloid leukemia, non-small cell lung cancer, gastric carcinoma, GIST, this is gastric carcinoma again, metastatic breast cancer, melanoma, renal, so number of you know, cancers. Again, coming back to the same theme of poly overlapping specificity, even for these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you can see number of them actually are being, in, they interact not only with ABCB1 or PGP, but also ABCG2. And this is the, you know, the problem because even though these transporters have never seen these drugs, they develop the, um, they can try handle these. All these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you know, you know do not have any structural, again, um, similarity. They are hydrophobic, amphipathic. But one common feature they have is that all of these were developed as competitive inhibitors of ATP site on tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So if you look at a tyrosine kinase inhibitor like BCR able kinase, you have two sites. One is the site for ATP. The other site is where the, your protein substrate binds with the tyrosine residue. So the ATP is, is hydrolyzed and the and then it phosphorylates the substrate of tyrosine which actually activates the signal transduction pathway leading to uncontrolled growth. But now instead of ATP, if you put imatinib or nilatinib or any of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you, you do not have that effect because you are not phosphorylating tyrosine. Okay? And that's how you kill then the cancer cell. So you remember this is binding into the ATP site and preventing the phosphorylation. But when we, uh, and there is no cell death then. But interestingly, the same tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we would have expected them to bind to ATP sites of the transporters. But actually they don't bind to the ATP binding pocket. Instead, they bind to the substrate binding pocket in the membrane and then you know they get pumped out. So even though we do have ATP sites and ABC transporters but they are slightly different than the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, they, and that's the reason why these inhibitors instead of binding to the ATP site they bind to the substrate binding site. And majority of the people working in tyrosine kinase inhibitor field, they, don't, they are not aware that this is what happens. Uh, they still think these kinase inhibitors bind to ATP sites of the transporters. And again, you know, you can show this by using the, um, uh, either the capillaries, rat brain capillaries where we use the body P uh, derivative of nilotinib or you can use the treated nilotinib uh, with polarized LHCPK cells. You can use multiple different assays. Bottom line is they get transported and they are not really as. So our goal was to see now, okay, this is being transported. So we wanted to know what are the structural features to de that determine interactions of tyrosine kinase inhibitors with ABC drug transporters, like how they are different from substrates or modulators. Can we identify the binding site of tyrosine kinase inhibitor? in the drug binding pocket of PGP. And then can this information be used to design tyrosine kinase inhibitors that do not interact with PGP or other ABC transporters. So basically, can we develop another tyrosine kinase inhibitor with ability to inhibit tyrosine kinase but not being transported by transporters. And so we synthesized the number of derivatives of nilotinib in, uh, at NIH. And then we looked at their effect on transport. This we looked on, you know, on the Monday we discussed the calcium AM assay, 
how you can you know look at just fluorescence and this is just plotted on the single graph this is the control where there is no drug um, uh, nilotinib or any derivative added and this is your positive control tariquidar and uh, you can see there is a variation uh, in the inhibition and then we also looked at the its effect on ATPase activity as well as binding of prezosin analog and then we collaborated with Tanaji Talele at St. John's University who is a medicinal chemist and he used this pharmacophore alignment and scoring engine uh, to come to see whether we can you know describe a pharmacophore and this was the these are the steps building a pharmacophore QSR model and hypothesis from a set of ligands and when these these parameters were, were used interestingly what we found is that this is the pharmacophore for the BCR able kinase okay so this is a seven point pharmacophore which for the nilotinib so you have the A is for the hydrogen bond acceptor uh, D is the hydrogen bond donor R is the aromatic rings and then H is the hydrophobe and you can see it's very similar to the peak like a protein and this is but you remember this is in the membrane this is in the ATP binding site and there is a slight difference in the ABCG2 where you have one more uh, hydrophobe so once we have this pharmacophore we decided to dock this into the substrate binding site using the homology model we looked at how you, we can do this and identified the residues which are given by this uh, rectangular um, red which is like tyrosine 307 uh, there is one here A985 methionine 949 and multiple of these L975 so wh once we know that okay this is how nilotinib binds in the binding pocket we selected these residues and mutated them and sh sure enough when you do that Actually, I'm not showing that data, but when you do that, you show that you lose the binding of nilotinib, and which suggests that the docking studies can be validated by mutagenesis. So the other side of this is that if you have um, compounds, derivatives lacking key features like pyrimidine and other groups, you'll find that then when you delete these, whether they bind or not. So you use both the SAR approach as well as mutagenesis approach and identify the binding sites. So th these are the conclusions for this. Unlike BCR able kinase, imatinib, nilotinib, and other tyrosine kinase inhibitors do not interact at the ATP binding site of peak glycoprotein or ABCG2. TKIs interact at the drug binding pocket and are substrates of a ABC drug transporters. By using molecular docking, mutagenesis mapping, and QSAR, the binding site, at least for one uh, nilotinib, has been identified. And these were the residues critical for binding. And pyridine and pyrimidine rings of nil in nilotinib play a key role in its interaction with drug binding pocket. So what we are doing now is taking this scaffold and see can we make uh, additional derivatives which will retain the kinase inhibition but no, not be uh, recognized by the transporters. And that's the ongoing work. So this is another approach where you, you know, use the SAR doc and then validate by mutagenesis and then go from there. Okay, any questions on this? Sir, yes. How logical it is to use a as a TK But that's but that, that's what happens in the clinic. This is already it's currently used in uh, clinic to you know treat chronic myeloid leukemia and other cancers. But but the reason is yeah as a TKI uh, to overcome the you know tumor growth. And one of the reason could be that you have to use higher doses if you know it's being transported. Beyond the threshold. Exactly. So. Th as of like these are some of the other uh, mechanisms how you could look for uh, developing modulators 
as I told you earlier, you could go for at the transcription level, translation level, or at the transporter level. So here, you know, some of these like synthetic siRNA you could use, uh, and then knock down the transcription. You also have the shRNA vector. You could, you know, do the same. So these are multiple like hammerhead ribosome. These are all being tested in the lab, but they have not never been uh, gone to the clinic because of the many problems. You could also alter the plasma membrane alterations, and these are your transported settings here. here. Uh, also, drug encapsulation, like in lys uh, liposomes, or you can have a pro-drug, and then because the pro-drugs are not going to be recognized by transporters, and then once you, they come into the cells, you could hydrolyze and then act on the target. We also discussed about the use of antibodies, monoclonal, because currently antibodies are used as anti-cancer treatment, at least HER2 uh, receptors and others. Okay. So Kurt, these are some of the additional methods the with, uh, the, that are under experimental you know, conditions ongoing, nanoemulsion or nanoparticles for delivery of anti-cancer drugs. So belief is that if you have emulsion or use of nanoparticles, you could bypass transporters. And then in encapsulation in liposomes. Uh, this has been actually around for a long time, but there are issues of delivery of liposomes because at least in animal model, most of the liposomal uh, drugs go to lung. And it's not clear why uh, lip the lipid, that could be dip depending on the lipid receptors and others. And we just discussed about the pro drugs, which are not transport uh, substrates for ABC drug transporters, uh, monoclonal antibodies, UIC2, 5D3 for these transporters. And then this is what we were dis discussing non toxic natural compounds with the ability to inhibit multiple transporters. And this is to increase the bioavailability, similar to at least to the level, level of anti cancer drugs by increasing absorption and decreased metabolism with dissemination or combination of compounds, extracts, where you know they have synergistic effect. So these are some of the things you could do. Then another approach also is, you know, we discussed that most of these transporters are present on cell surface and they have, a, their half-life at the cell surface is very long. That's one of the feature of these transporters. So is there any way, to, and we also know recently, we actually followed the fate of the transporters from cell membrane to intracellular organelles. And we found that most of PGP as well as ABCG2, actually they get internalized to lysosomes and then degraded in lysosomes. Okay. So uh, one, uh, approach could be that you, are, you screen the compounds which will rapidly remove the transporters from cell membrane and uh, lead to the degradation. And this is also now actually would be another approach to screen natural compounds, not necessarily to be um, inhibiting the transporters but increasing the degradation pathway. There are some of the proteosomal inhibitors currently in the clinic for treatment of some of the cancers. Because, you know, most of these uh, proteasomal inhibitors, uh, protein degradation inhibitors, MG115 or lactocysteine, uh, do have effect on cancer cells. Okay? So this would be another way you could consider about developing modulators, not necessarily as inhibitors. So I think that's what I wanted to tell you about the, how you could use the approaches for developing different modulators. How the things happens, mechanism of this has to come from like you and you will explain us more properly that how it happens. But just wanted to introduce, maybe you have discussed it yesterday or? Uh, we just discussed the GWAS study. So Yes, yes. So we, uh, so just because we conducted a genome-wide association studies on the gallbladder cancer, you know the gallbladder cancer is very common cancer in India. So this cancer is not in uh, UK or the US, but it's only present in the Chile, Mexico, 
and few other population in pockets and even in India uh, its distribution is not uniform. So, South India do not have the gallbladder cancer you have only in the north gangetic belt and northeast. So, then the, what are the reasons whether they are genetic reasons and whether they are lifestyle reasons. So, that was the questions. So, the, we did the extensive lifestyle question also. So, those data are also available and then we did the GWAS which we scan 700,000 uh, typical on the Illumina scan without any hypothesis and just uh, looked for the genome wide significance. And uh, so, we were thinking that this we will get the similar type of some SNPs which are identified in the breast or colon cancer or other thing, but to surprise the, the thing the all the SNPs which were significant at genome wide 10 to minus 9 level which is genome wide significant level, they were all from uh, this region ABCB4 and ABCB1. Uh, and most of the SNPs, so they, they are not, so this is the whole reason where, where you have the ABC before and the ABC B once. So, this, you, this is a hot map, uh, heat map they call it and uh, everything is very significant at the level of 10 to minus 9. So, then this, uh, so from epidemiological, from observation point it was very clear that there is something because it is a large scale study with such a high significant and only why this will come significant, why others are not coming. So, then we search the literature and it comes out that okay, it is uh, somehow it is related to that because this ABCB4 in particular is a like transporter of phospholipid uh, which is a co component of the bile and uh, so if that phospholipid transportation from liver to uh, uh, the gallbladder is disturbed if there is a polymorphism that is what is said. And so we thought it is quite biologically possible that uh, if, if the bile does not contain more lipid in it, so then the bile is become more salty you know and then that more salty bile if it is present in the gallbladder then it could be more uh, dangerous because then if you have the infection or if you have a gallstone which is stretching there then because of the salt the infection get uh, like more uh, something pronounced. So, that could be the one of the, the mechanism that, that is possible that we thought and then ABCB1 is another thing which is there are a lot of uh, studies with ABC, MRD uh, associated thing and then it also I think. Uh, uh, transport lot of xenobiotic out of the system and I think one of the way of uh, excreting the xenobiotic is uh, through the pushing of the bile. And so, if somehow if the bile is not getting pushed up through the, uh, the if there is a problem with the gallbladder motility or the bile is not proper and bile is not getting pushed up and then this, there is a, dis disturb a disturbance in that with the ABCB1 polymorphism then I think lot of xenobiotic compounds are not getting uh, out of the body, flushed out of the body. So, that could be uh, uh, we thought that it could be the another mechanism uh, speculated for the ABCB1. So, of course, now it is up to you sir, uh, to say that uh, what is the real thing and someone has to do actually real animal experiment or what are the compounds. And then for, from the experimental the lifestyle questioner point of view we see the mustard oil uh, is a very strong risk factor. So, whether uh, so uh, whether the impurities in the mustard oil which get stuck into this, the second risk factors we see is the infection with the salmonella typhi is another very strong risk factors is there and of course, obesity is uh, for many of the cancers. Uh, so, and then heavy metals. So, like the arsenic and the cadmium they are uh, seems to be not very strong, but they are also seems to be the risk factors and because they get stored into the gallbladder uh, all these um, heavy metals it is quite possible that if, again if they are not excreted properly from the gallbladder and there for a long time they might cause some inflammation and something like that. So, is do you think that the mustard oil and ABCB1 there are like some connections on this? Possibly depends on the as you said, contaminations impurity in that yeah. So, maybe we have to see the composition of the mustard oil uh, that how it is and the other thing is why then it is other the gangetic belt that the liver. So, uh, uh, where the ganga flows mostly the incidence of the gallbladder cancer is along the, those lines. Even in the chili if you see there are areas where the gallbladder cancer are not common and the areas where you have the uh, river uh, there is more gallbladder cancer. So, it could be more associated with some infection and something like that. So, Arsenic contents are also there in some of that belt. So, the arsenic, yes, yes, the Bangladesh and uh, the, that area has the more arsenic contents. Uh, nickel and cadmium is also there, uh, which also responsible for gallstone formation. The gallstone is also one of the mechanism that it causes. But there seems to be some role of ABCB1 and ABCB4 for sure from our observational point of view. And that initial uh, interpretation suggests that there could be something 
which needs to like further study it and uh, do some uh, biological like experimental studies where you can really prove and that might also be one of the reason that why the prognosis is very poor because if the ABCB1 is involved uh, in it and then we know that the prognosis of all no chemotherapy works in gallbladder cancer. So hardly one year is the maximum uh, seen. So you can't even stratify the gallbladder cancer patient some are living longer and some are living less uh, like breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So everyone is dying within six to eight months. It's such a bad prognosis disease. No chemotherapy works. So uh, maybe the because of this involvement of ABCB1 here you know that it, from the beginning uh, it, it is very poor prognosis disease actually. So that's uh, the thing that I wanted to share. Yeah.